Hi, welcome to the next in our OSTR series on cutting edge methodologies. Today we're going to talk about structural mass spectrometry and its applications using cross-linking and limited proteolysis. First, cross-linking mass spectrometry is an experimental workflow used to identify constituents of large macromolecular complexes. It can be used to identify sites of protein dimerization or disulfide formation, to compare protein conformations in different conditions, as well as to obtain distance constraints for modeling of protein structures and conformation of protein complexes. This is a methodology that can be applicable to multiple different sample types, including complexes with up to 100 different subunits, and is applicable with pulldowns and in vivo applications both. The crosslinking reaction can be done using multiple different types of crosslinkers with complementary chemistries to target different types of residues. The methodology is also compatible with fractionation and enrichment steps, which will increase the ability to identify the crosslinked peptides. Then there's usually a mass spec acquisition step, some sort of data analysis, including new software for differential quantitation, and visualization and modeling of protein complexes. So this is just an example of a peptide with lysine residues highlighted in the light purple within the protein. A crosslinker is added, which then allows, in this case, crosslinking of proximal lysine residues together. When the protein is digested, those residues stay locked together with a covalent modification, and then they can be analyzed to detect the sequence of the peptide as well as the site of the crosslink. It's important to keep in mind that when a crosslinking agent is applied, there are multiple different types of crosslinks that can be formed. The most beneficial are intramolecular or intermolecular crosslinks, in which two different peptide sequences are crosslinked, because these are the ones that actually give conformational information. Less useful but more prevalent are monolinks, in which one peptide is crosslinked but the other end never crosslinks to anything, and loop links, in which two residues within the same peptide are crosslinked together. I, both of these types will unfortunately not give any useful information for conformational changes or complex information. There are multiple different types of crosslinkers that can be used. These start with reagents such as EDC, which is a zero length crosslinker that will crosslink carboxylic to amine residues. These are really nice because they're effectively crosslinking hydrogen bonds. Also common are things such as DSS or BS3. These are traditional crosslinkers of size approximately 11 angstroms that crosslink amine residues. And also there are photo crosslinkers, which can crosslink an amine to any other amino acid after application of UV light. In addition, there are mass spectrometry cleavable crosslinkers such as DSSO, which are commercially available. And these are very convenient. When crosslinked into the protein and then analyzed in the mass spectrometer, the fragmentation of the instrumentation will lead to cleavage of the crosslinker with a very common and distinctive pattern of tagged forms of the protein. These can then be used to set up the instrument to identify and target the peptides for further fragmentation and lead to much less complicated mass spectra. In addition, there has recently been the use of short distance crosslinkers for um, development of structure restraints for modeling of protein complexes. And a few of those examples are given here. So there's lots of different types of crosslinkers available, and what you choose may depend on your experimental question. After crosslinking, it's often a good idea to do some sort of an enrichment step. This includes size exclusion or ion exchange chromatography, which are used to enrich the crosslinked peptide over non-modified peptides. These enrichment steps are very critical, especially for large protein complexes, because the number of cross-linked peptides as opposed to non-cross-linked peptides is very small. And so without the enrichment, it's very difficult to identify and detect the cross-linked peptides. Because these peptides tend to be larger and have more charge, they can be enriched using either the size exclusion or ion exchange chromatography. In my own recent set of data, just to show you how important this enrichment step is, I found that the cross-link spectra tended to be between 0.5 and approximately 8% of the total spectra identified, whereas the loop-linked were about another 5%, the mono-linked were 10 to 50%, and unmodified somewhere between 40 and 85%. 
So the peptides that we want to see with the crosslinks that really show us the conformational information tend to be the low end. And so an enrichment step to bring them up is very useful. There are also multiple different software packages that have been used to help identify and provide information about crosslink peptides. Some of these are commercially available um, and do a very nice job of analyzing crosslink data. Part of the reason it's important to have nice crosslink data um, and software is because the spectra, unless you're using a mass spec cleavable crosslinker, tend to be very complicated. This is an example mass spectrum, and it's actually a very nice one. What you see are the combination fragmentation spectra for two peptides that are cross-linked together. Because they're attached, we see fragment ions coming from both parts of the cross-link, uh, both of the peptides that are cross-linked together. This is what we want because this provides us with the sequence information to know which two peptides are being cross-linked together and where the cross-linking occurs. However, this type of clean data with this extent of cross-linking is very rare. And in fact, spectra often may look something more like this, where we still have good distribution of ions across the crosslinker, but there's a lot more fragmentation occurring, or they may even look like this. Again, where you see a lot of other ions that aren't matching, not quite as good of coverage of the peptide, but still enough to know what the sequence is and where the crosslink occurs. So with the difficult spectra to interpret, and the low isolation rate of the cross-link peptides. That's why the addition of both enrichment strategies help, as well as mass spec compatible cross-linkers, which would cleave in the instrument and give somewhat cleaner spectra. Both of these help to give better data quality. So as I said, cross-linking has been suggested to be used for structural analysis. Similar to NMR experiments, cross-linking mass spec can be used to provide distance restraints that can be used for ensemble of structural models to help with complexes that don't have structures already. In these cases, short distance crosslinks are often better for restraining models than long distance crosslinkings because you need that short distance to really restrain the complex. The long distances don't really help because there are so many options that could meet that restraint. In these cases, often one would need further experiments to validate the model which would include deuterium exchange mass spec, long distance cross-linking, and surface modification. These are ensembles of models, predicted structures, not true structures themselves. So additional information to validate predictions are as essential to have to really know that you have a good model. This is an example of using high density photo cross-linking for albumin, just to show you again how it can work. In this case, this is the albumin process protein, and you see all of the red cross-links that occur there's a very nice distribution of crosslinks that happen at the short distance, whereas poorly matched or um, decoy falsely identified tend to have long distances. And if one then looks at either the purified or the serum containing albumin, you can see that they have very similar uh, models that show similar distance restraints, whereas if there's no crosslinking, we just see this very odd conformation that shows no relationship to the native protein. So this is just to show you that this type of method can be used to get structural information about proteins. Another method that can be used to try and understand conformations and conformational changes is limited proteolysis coupled to mass spectrometry. In this methodology, upon a conformational change or complex formation, sites may become opened up or obscured for protease digestion. Limited proteolysis of a protein under different conditions, followed by mass spectrometry analysis, can be used to characterize these changes and look at where protein conformation changes are occurring. Conformational parameters such as accessibility, segmental mobility, and solvent exposition correlate quite well with limited proteolytic sites. So this would help you to see where there are changes in protein conformation, where binding sites are taking place, and what is exposed and what is not. In a standard limited proteolysis experiment, a protein is incubated with a protease for a short amount of time because we don't want complete proteolysis of the protein, just cleavage of accessible sites. After this, there's a mass spec analysis performed, and this can be performed under, the proteolysis can be performed under different conditions for different times to look at different exposures of these residues. Cleavage sites that are usually located in disordered regions or domains or in regions with enhanced flexibility um, may see a lot more cleavage. 
Um, in contrast to classic methods to get structural information of a protein, limited proteolysis is quite nice because it doesn't require as much of the protein or as much experimental effort to really get good data. So this is sort of a nice initial approach to see if there are conformational changes occurring and to get some initial data to help direct further downstream experiments. It's important to keep in mind that the outcome of a limited proteolysis experiment is not high resolution information. Instead, partial digestion and other structure determination methods are usually combined to allow monitoring of conformational transitions upon addition of substrate, cofactor, or an inhibitor. It's a first step, it's not the last step. This is an example looking at um, a specific protein that's been incubated with um, trypsin to do limited proteolytic digestion. So as you can see, as time passes, the input protein decreases in abundance and these lower fragments increase. And then mass spectrometry analysis can be used to identify where the different cleavages are occurring in each of these different fragments and what sites become exposed and affected in limited proteolysis. For these experiments, there are several reaction conditions that are critical. Um, the pH of the sample is important because one wants to maintain the native conformation of the substrate, maximize the stability of the substrate regardless of the optimum pH for enzymatic activity, and one needs to keep in mind that a non-optimal pH may affect the protease activity itself. So there's a lot of balancing to be done to keep native conformation of the protein as well as some activity of the protease itself. The digestion time is something that can also be optimized. As the incubation time increases, fragments become released from the intact protein that are then subdigested by the protease, giving rise to smaller peptides. These peptides originate from other proteolytic fragments, and so they don't actually give any information about the native protein complex. They're really only released once the protein starts being digested, and so they have little information. So you don't want the digestion to go on too long, or these smaller, less interesting fragments will start to dominate. Finally, the enzyme to protein ratio is very critical. In fact, some people think it's the most important factor to modulate the selectivity of the protease. One can limit the activity even when a broad specificity enzyme is used by changing just the ratio of enzyme to protein. Usually, the amount of enzyme you want to use will be different for a protein alone versus a protein complex. And that's because the complex itself has lower accessibility than the individual components because it has a tighter, more compact conformation. So you may need to optimize the amount of enzyme across different experimental conditions. Several different proteases are often used, and people will even use panels of proteases with different specificities to get different and overlapping information. The selectivity of cleavage is not related to or limited by the specificity of the enzyme, and instead, grouping of the preferential cleavage sites within the same region, if you use overlapping sites, can be used to help know that you're really looking at the real accessible site and not just some sort of an off-target information. It's also important to quench the reaction. For both reproducibility and to avoid overhydrolysis, complete quenching of proteolytic activity is critical. Because the quenching needs to be both instant and complete, Changing conditions, particularly pH, is the most common way to do it. Often one would quench by addition of trifluoroacetic acid or acetonitrile. Denaturants are also used, though some proteases will show residual activity in the presence of denaturants, and so you need to know if you have good quenching conditions. These are just some examples of different proteases and the specificity for cleavage, as well as common kinase to protein ratios that have been used for these types of experiments. One very nice experimental design includes the use of a reference sample to an experimental sample. In the reference sample, for example, in this case, a denatured kinase that's fully unfolded, um, digestion is done to, to completeness to know what are the fragments that can be analyzed. The protein is also labeled with isotopically labeled butyrate so that the peptide masses will shift. Then there's an experimental sample, which in this case would be a kinase with a small molecule, which is in the folded condition, Limited proteolysis is performed using a lower trypsin to protein ratio for a short time, and then light labeling with a light form of the butyrate. The samples are pooled and analyzed by mass spec. And in this case, the ratio 
of the limited proteolysis peptides to the complete proteolysis peptides gives important information about conformational differences. So in this case, you can see where they've applied this to looking at BRAF kinases induced by small molecule binding. You can see that for different peptides, the different um, forms and different states show different cleavage propensities, which can be used to identify binding sites on the protein and to understand how they affect conformational change. In addition, people have used whole cell limited proteolysis to analyze protein structural changes directly in the biological context of the proteome on a whole cell scale. Um, this is a very interesting methodology that includes um, some different limited proteolysis steps. Um, it does have some limitations. It gives a list of proteins that change, but it doesn't tell you the nature of the change. Um, you don't know if there's differences in accessibility due to ligand binding, protein aggregation, or even altered interactors. Currently, this is a method that's only been used for medium to high abundance proteins, and it tends to be biased against uh, membrane proteins because they tend to be less accessible. And it's best when used to compare multiple treatment conditions. But it is something to keep in mind that may be interesting in your own research. Just to show how they've used it, in this case, there are multiple different enzymes used to look at different proteins. And what you can see are different sites of accessibility. And so in this case, the authors would first use a generic um, prote uh, proteolysis step to look at uh, the proteolysis and then follow it up with triptych digestion. And in that case, where they have semi-triptych peptides, those are the sites of limited proteolytic activity. And so that's how they know where there is cleavage. And then by comparing different conditions of the cell, they can look at how the protein conformation has changed. But again, they don't know why the change has occurred. So for more information about these types of methods and to think about how you could use them in your own research, please feel free to contact your local mass spectrometrist. Within the NCI, you can talk to me, Lisa Jenkins, or my colleague, Thorkel Anderson and Frederick. Within the wider NIH community, I would direct you to visit the CREX for more information about available resources. Thank you very much for your attention. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, Cancer.gov, 1-800-4-CANCER. Produced August 2019.